John, hello. Hi, I am. John, there's been reports this week that Japanese authorities are considering entombing the Fukushima site in concrete, as was done 25 years ago to contain the radiation caused by the Chernobyl disaster. Can you tell us what happens when concrete and sand are used to seal off the Chernobyl reactor? Well, you know, every accident is different and every outcome is different. So every solution it follows must be different. Mm -hmm. The Fukushima situation is entirely different to uh, the Chernobyl situation. You know, at Chernobyl, what happened at Chernobyl, it was the immediate response that was so troublesome. What the Soviets, the then Soviets, did was they bombed the reactor with sand, boron containing sand, right. to try and stop the nuclear process. That sand then turned into a glassy substrate that literally sealed the reactor in. So what we thought at the time would be a radioactive release that might last a day, perhaps a day and a half to two days, because of that action of actually putting a silicate layer over the reactor, it allowed the reactor to cook and cook, the temperatures to rise, the radioactive fission products to break down even further, and then suddenly on day two and three, the silicate broke down and out came a very massive release that lasted for six days. So the immediate action, unless it's carefully thought through, can in fact lead you up the road to a disaster. What else should they have done, though, with the core exposed the way it was at Chernobyl? What, what were the options available to them at that time? The, the first and best option in a radioactive disaster is to move the people away. That's the only mitigation and countermeasure you can apply effectively is to evacuate shelter and then evacuate the population maybe with some prolactic measures like potassium iodate then you think through the solution you take some time to have it peer reviewed I, this is all in hindsight of right course. of course but you you review the situation you certainly don't jump to a problem and, and that's what we've seen at Fukushima we've seen the Japanese operator TEPCO the Tokyo Electric Power Company try and ad hoc solutions, expedient solutions, which in many ways, like that Russian example at Chernobyl, some of the actions of the Japanese may well have made the situation worse. This constant ejection of water, the flooding of the turbine halls, the contamination, the breakdown of the suppression systems, all of these may have worsened the situation rather than mitigated it. Okay, I, I want to talk about that in just a moment, but, but the, the, the idea of a sarcophagus is still being considered in Japan. Why do you think that is? It's not an option at the moment. You, if you're going to, first of all, at Chernobyl, you had one reactor co to contain. Here you've got four reactors to contain, three of which have had quite violent explosions, and the other one's had a very severe explosion or recriticality incident in the fuel pond. You still have, because the fuel is still there, you're going to have a call-in requirement for that fuel, some sort of institutional management of the fuel for many months, if not years to come, before you can put in, in place a passive system that will take the heat away. So you really can't immediately encase the reactors in concrete and walk away from it. You have to look at a management system that's going to take the heat. If you simply encase these reactors in concrete, the heat from the remaining fuel that's in the reactors would simply crack and break open the contract, concrete. There would probably be some very violent chemical reactions between the molten fuel and the concrete, and that would lead to a radioactive release. So these things have to be very carefully thought through. So the ad hoc measures that the Japanese have been taking so far, the, the bombarding of the plants with water, do you think that that's part of the reason why there's now this problem with radioactive water and radioactive uh, seawater around the, around the reactors? I, I don't want to be too harsh on the Japanese because, you know, they've just undergone a national calamity. Right. You know, the, the earthquake and tsunami across the nation was very severe, and their emergency resources must have been stretched to the absolute limit. And then suddenly you find there's a nuclear disaster on your hands as well. Yeah. So you've got to be kind to them and sympathetic to them in some ways. But it does seem to be that this constant bombardment with water, they seem to have adapted the back leg of the nuclear reactor circuit. I don't want to get more sophisticated than that. But they seem to have adapted that. And that may have led, in fact, to some of the safety issues that have occurred in the interim. Mm -hmm. But the water is now the water, the enormous amount of water on the site seawater, freshwater, is contaminated, particularly from reactor number two, 
that contaminated water is now making the radiological incursion of essential workers into the site very difficult. Right, right. So in, in, a best, in, in the best possible scenario, how would a controlled decommissioning of the Fukushima reactors roll out? What would they have to do and how long would that take? Okay, obviously the first thing is the water, the troublesome water. That's got to be pumped out of the trenches and the underground passages and tunnels. It's got to be put into a reserve pool that is covered, and then it's got to have some treatment facility that will somehow separate the solvents and sludges and particulate matter, the radioactive matter, parts of fuel from that water so the water can then be discharged. That may take five to ten years to actually operate. There's about 10,000 tons of water now estimated mm -hmm. that will require in a few weeks some form of institutional treatment and it certainly can't be released into the ocean. There has been a very significant discharge into the local marine environment. Yes. And this is what peculiar about this one, which this is what sets Fukushima aside from Chernobyl. The discharge has been into the marine environment rather than the atmospheric environment. So the first line of attack is on preventing more ecological excursions into that sensitive marine environment. That's the first line. The yeah. next, one, next one is to look at the fuel in those three reactors and the damaged fuel in the fourth reactor spent fuel pond. You, now we've got to look at a system where you can manage the heat dissipation and some of the nuclear activity because you don't want another criticality incident to occur. So now we've got to look at the physics of the nuclear nucleonics going on to make sure we can manage those. Those management routines may have to be in place for several tens of years. And, and that would involve, I mean, ultimately, though, that does involve taking the damaged reactor out of the hulk of, of the old building? No, leave in situ. You know, what you have now, when you look at these photographs, you can see those, those, those clean engineering assemblies are now have been reduced to a chaotic mess. Yes. You couldn't even get a robot in there to pick its way through that debris. You know, a robot will work nicely when you've got nice engineering drawings to tell it where to go, what to do. When you've got a mess like that, that robot's got to work at something like 60 meters height, remotely, in a very intense radiation field, working with hot, volatile materials. Very challenging task. Then you go back to the old sarcophagus idea, the idea of enclosing it from atmospheric discharges, but with somehow having access to the fissile materials so that they can eventually be encapsulated or somehow neutralized. Some of these materials have half-lives of 30 years, so you're going to go for, for example, cesium, cesium-137, about 30 years half-life. That's going to go through 10 half-lives before it's radiologically innocuous, so that's about 300 years. One of the reactors, number three, was actually fueled with plutonium. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years. Yes. So it's radioactive. It's intense as a radiological uh, hazard for about a quarter of a million years. Plenty of time to think through the solutions. <laughs> well, the, the nuclear crisis at Three Mile Island in 1979 was handled a lot differently. Were those reactors ever removed from the core of the reactor building? Cleanup was the idea in America. In the Three Mile Island incident, one of the reactors, only one of the reactors went wrong, not like here, three and plus the fuel. Mm -hmm. One reactor went wrong. The containment, that dome that characterizes the pressurized water reactor, which Three Mile Island was, that dome held its ground. A little bit of radioactivity released, some radioactive iodine got out, but most of the rea 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 radioactivity was actually caught in. It got out of the reactor. That's about the size of a single deck of bus inside that big containment dome. It broke through that and melted through that, but then it dissipated on the concrete floor and was eventually cored. They cleaned up Three Mile Island by removing the radioactive materials remotely, drumming it, packaging it, and taking off to Hanford, etc. That cost took about a decade to do, and that cost in the 1980s, the late 1980s, about, I remember the exact figure, 997 million U.S. dollars. Yeah, and that was, for, that was for a building that wasn't in rubble the way that the Fukushima plants are. And it wasn't not just the building not in rubble, that the material, a lot of radioactivity has got out, so you've now got to extend the cleanup operations to away from the narrow confines of the Fukushima number one plant site, out to the ocean, out to the back, up to Fukushima City, which is 61 kilometers to the north uh, east. So we've now got to extend into the public domain now. Decontamination, 
loss of arable land, loss of use, uh, restrictions on living and habitation, food controls, the bill could be absolutely enormous. And we're still talking about best case scenarios here. And this, this week we did see release of radiation from, from some of the reactors. What's the worst case scenario right now for Fukushima? It's, it's not stopped. It's, uh, this morning I'm doing, a, I'm doing a daily update report for an international orga organization and I am still warning of difficulties with number two reactor and number one reactor. So there are still instabilities going on. And, you know, really, this really is... Fund what's fundamentally wrong with our nuclear industry is the way in which you demonstrate nuclear safety. And what we can see here is because we considered such an event, an earthquake running through to a tsunami with all the in incremental steps like the nuclear grid falling offline, the diesel's not starting or being overturned by the tsunami, etc. The, the nuclear operator, TEPCO, and the nuclear regulator, they must have considered that such an incredible event, so remote, that they didn't have to plan for it. It was almost like saying, in the North Atlantic, that tiny speck of ice, that iceberg, and you know where I'm going with this, right. that iceberg didn't have a chance, the remoteness, the chance of it hitting that little transatlantic liner was so remote that it could be considered incredible, so no need to plan for it. In other words, no need to make the Titanic an unsinkable ship, no need to put lifeboats on it for its maiden voyage. And that was a situation perhaps that arose at Fukushima and Fremont Island. They didn't plan for this particular inevitable accident. They didn't have the plans, they didn't rehearse them, so they don't know what to do when it occurs. And they have been, I think we all have to admit this, they had been running around somewhat like headless chickens, panicking and putting various uh, untried methods in place. So now here is an opportunity for the nuclear industry, if we look at it this way, and th there is a possibility of changing the way that energy is regulated. Do you think that that will happen as a result of Fukushima? Well, f I believe Fukushima represents that the nuclear regulatory regime internationally is fundamentally flawed. You know, I could take a nuclear regulator from Vancouver, from uh, Britain, from France, and that regulator would quite happily swap places with the Japanese regulator. Here we use the same codes of practice, the same radiation dose limitation system, the same ASME standards for the reactor pressure vessel, and so on and so forth. So what we've seen here, although the key words in the failure at Fukushima are earthquake and tsunami, what we've seen is this business of probabilistic risk where you say, we as designers, mankind, we have the wit to foresee every possible accident and the frequency and the severity of that accident. And that is clearly not true. And when you have a very hazardous industry like this, that if it goes wrong, it has contempt for boundaries, contempt for international boundaries, contempt for the delicate ecosystems that run around these plants, then, of course, we really have to stand back and redress these issues. John Large, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. That was John Large, a nuclear analyst and engineer who's visited and reported on both Fukushima and Chernobyl. He joined us from our studio in London.